Okay, so we will now move on and discuss the last part of its setup, which we have here, which is namely uh, the detectors. And we will start off discussing the CCD or charge couple device uh, detector. And this is mainly for historical reasons uh, because the CCD uh, came before the CMOS detector, which we will discuss today. Uh, and CCD detectors are today mainly found in high, some high-end instruments and, and space applications. So they are not so common anymore. Okay, so how do they work? So the CCD, so over here we have a CCD, and it's built up of an array of P-doped MOS capacitors. And when light impinges on this, uh, on this detector, the, the photons are converted into electrons by the photoelectric effect. And these electrons are then stored in these capacitors which, makes up, uh, which, uh, which make up this array. And the trick then is to be able to read out all, the, all these charges in all of these pixel wells within the detector. And this is done in a very cunning way. So you see here, there's a, bun there's a bunch of uh, wires going in and these wires are connected, hooked up so that all of these uh, row here can the voltage on the, on the PMOS capacitors can be changed. I will soon show you how this is done. And, and one row at a time. And what you do is you change it in a way so that you are moving down the charge in each, each of these rows at the same time. So you basically move it down one row and then the charge comes down to the bottom row here. And then the bottom row is set up so that you can do it but in this direction instead. So then you read this row out one, one well at a time uh, into uh, this amplifier which changes the charge in, into a voltage and, and it's amplified. And then it goes off the chip and then you have a number of gain stage and analog to digital converters, which converts it into a digital signal. Okay, so that's the overall architecture of this. So let's look at how the charge is transferred. Oops, that was too far. So here I have a little animation. Let's see if it plays. Yeah, here it goes. So this is the voltage which you put on these rows here, and then the same thing goes for one uh, for the line that for the for the line down here it's done exactly the same way so you have electrons here and they are attracted to this and if you now make the next one positive and then go to zero for this one all the electrons is traversed to the next one and then you make the next one positive and it attracts all the electrons you can look at this in a little a little while so it's basically done by turning this one positive the electron and then turning this to zero that means all the electrons move here and then you make this one positive and turn this one to zero and all the electrons move here. And by doing this, we can shift out the electrons so we come down to this converter down here. So this was the CCD detector. And I think in, I looked it up in 2017 and then only 11% of all the uh, image detectors used were CCD detectors and it's going down. So this is not so common anymore. What is common is the CMOS uh, detector. And as far as I know, this is in all new consumer electronics, this is the detector used. And when they were introduced, they were not so good as the CD, CCD detectors, but to get, today they are as good or better for consumer electronics. So here is the circuit for each pixel in the CMOS sensor. So in each pixel of a sensor, there is a circuit which looks like this. And this has a number of uh, CMOS transistors. That's why it's called uh, CMOS detectors. And let's go through this and see how this works. So the first things which happen is for, for the whole of a, of a detector, you connect this reset transistor here. And that takes whatever charge is, is stored in this point and removes it. So now the whole detector is reset. Then when light impinges on the photodiode, so each pixel consists of a photodiode, and when light impinges on the photodiode, this creates an electron hole pair, very much in the reverse process of what happened in a, in a light emitting diode. So that means that we get, we get uh, electrons stored up, up, up here. 
and here we have a transistor and this gate this works as the gate for this CMOS transistor and this SF stands for source follower so so this transistor the more gate uh, the higher the gate voltage you have on this the more conducting this is so this is in principle a uh, charge controlled uh, resistor and that means that if the more light you have received the more current you will get uh, in the next step and then just as in the other set there's a lot for each row in this in this detector there's a row uh, line which you can turn on so you turn on one row at a time here when you turn on one row what you do is you turn on this resistor here which is this, uh, this uh, uh, transistor down here which is the select transistor so that in principle means that you conduct you connect the, your positive voltage supply up here via this one which is the resistor here which is controlled by how much light you received to the column wire and you do this for this for example for this row that means that all of this row is connected to all of the column wires going down here uh, where you get a current which is proportional to how much charged uh, charge you received and then down here you have a bunch of sample or hold amplifiers which basically measure this and uh, and measure this and holds the information and then you divide it down to uh, uh, fewer lines because in this one you can have of course have thousands of uh, columns and you don't quite have thousands of uh, of uh, converters so in this case this depends how much it's divided down depends on on the detector but in this case it goes from 100 lines to uh, 16 and MUX stands for a multiplexer or demultiplexer in this case and then you have 16 amplifiers which amplifies the signals and this goes away and eventually over here you have a whole bunch of analog to digital converter so in this case 16 and for some detectors it can be many more than 16 parallel analog to digital converters so if we now compare this with a CCD architecture let's see if we can get for CCD you see here you had one converter and here you have many parallel converter and that's one of the differences so that means that the CMOS detectors can be much faster uh, than the CCD detector another difference let me get the picture of a CMOS detector on here is that this since this is CMOS technology that means that you can make uh, you can make digital uh, you can make digital circuits on your actual chip and if you look here for the CCD detector the CCD detector convert covers the whole chip there is no electronic no converters or anything like this uh, on the actual chip but if you look on the CMOS detector there's a part which is covered at the bottom here and under this part which is covered here is all of this electronics uh, which converts the signal so there's a lot more electronics in the actual uh, in the actual chip itself and the parallel ar architecture of CMOS detectors mean that you have we have much faster cameras now so i think that i don't quite know but i think iphones is up to more than and many other phones as well are up to more than 200 frames per second and if you buy a high-end compact camera like for example like this one uh, that can do a thousand frames per second and this is for a consumer camera And since these CMOS detectors are in so many consumer products, they have got very cheap, which also makes them very interesting for spectroscopy applications. So this was two-dimensional detectors, but these detectors also exist in, in one-dimensional detectors. So I have a few examples of one-dimensional detectors here. So here we have a one-dimensional CCD. Here's a one-dimensional CMOS detector. And here is also a one-dimensional photodiode array so I'm now going to talk a little bit more about photodiode detectors but in this photodiode array there is actually an output for each photodiode in this array separately which allows this to work which allows you to collect signals fairly fast from uh, from these detectors 
But since photodiodes are so important, not only for spectroscopy, but uh, optical spectroscopy, but also even more so for laser spectroscopy, we're going to spend some time and, disco and discuss photodiodes. And in this case, it was a photodiode array, but we will start off discussing just a single photodiode and how it works and what are the, um, what are the noise properties. And many of the things we say here are like the photo statistics, for example, is not only applicable to photodiodes, it's also applicable to CCD and CMOS detectors. So it's more general than, than the discussion below. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay, so here we have a sy uh, symbol for a photodiode. And when you have a photon impinging on the photodiode, I, here over here is some uh, pictures of different photodiodes of different sizes. So they can be all from 100 micrometer or less and up to several centimeters in, in uh, diameter. Uh, and over here, when the photon impinges, this creates an electron hole pair. And the uh, electron goes down to this side of it and the, and the uh, hole goes out to this, so the hole goes out to the positive side. So that, that creates a if you have it, don't have it connected to anything, that can, creates a voltage over this photodiode. Uh, but well, the way which it's normally used for high for a higher speed, you can use it both with in the positive side. So if uh, this is like a higher voltage than this, but not you can't have a very high voltage because if you increase the voltage a lot, then this thing will actually start conducting. So you see, if you go up here, it starts conducting, and it becomes very non it becomes very nonlinear. So we normally use it in the negative side over here. So I made a test uh, setup down here, a test circuit, uh, example circuit, where we have some batteries which put a bias. So that means these batteries will put us on this side of, of uh, uh, this side uh, in the chart. And, and then a resistor, I will get back to this, and this is our photodiode. And then the diff if there is no light impinging on it, then it's the curve which lies here, so you see no light impinging on, on the photodiode, there's no electron hole pair generation, and you have a, you have a zero, uh, zero, the current, you see here on this side is the current, this current is zero. And then just like a normal diode, as you come out here, and you go to the positive side, the diode starts conducting. But again, we are out here. And since we have a voltage here, we will put ourselves at a certain point here. And now, the more power, so this is the optical power, the higher the power, the, the higher the generation of whole pair are and the larger the current we have. So when we go to 4 milliwatt, we follow this curve. When we go to 6 milliwatt, 8 milliwatt, and so on. And that means we get a current which is proportional to the applied, uh, applied uh, light level. And you can also see that it's not very sensitive if, uh, if the voltage over it varies that doesn't really change the current very much. So it's very, it's a very well behaved and these uh, photodiodes can be very linear in this regime. So most measurement setups measures voltage, like an analog to digital converter. So you want to convert this current into a voltage and that's done with this resistor over here. So you get a current and, and uh, this current creates a voltage over resistance and the larger the resistor you have, the larger the voltage you will get out for a certain current. Okay, so that's all fine, but what is the problem with this? Well, since it's too large, since the photodiode itself is too large PN uh, layers close together, that creates an inherent capacitance. So this is the, this capacitance here is not a capacitance we have added, but it's an inherent capacitance to the photodiode. And that means that when you want to change the voltage, this point will change in voltage now, because the voltage here is constant as you are changing the current. And that means you have to charge the capacitor here. So there will be a lot of charge going and, uh, to charging the capacitor. And that means that this, is, this circuit is not very fast. And you can look at it in a different way. If the impedance of this uh, capacitance is it's much uh, smaller than the resistance you have put here, most of the current will go through uh, the capacitance. Or vice versa, you can look at the, the charge you uh, create if you have high frequency, Will, will go to charge this capacitor up and down. Both, both uh, it's two different ways of saying the thing, same thing. So we would like to create a circuit where we can measure the current without the voltage over the diode changing. 
And that's called a trans impedance amplifier. It looks like this. So this uses an operational amplifier. Uh, and an operational amplifier works in the way that it measures the difference voltage between these output. So there's almost no current going into these output, very low current. For some, some uh, like FET input op amps, this current is super low. And it measures the difference in voltage here and amplifies it very strongly, uh, up to a million times or so on the output. And that means that the output changes until there is no longer, and then you have negative feedback, so it changes until there is no longer any difference in voltage between uh, these two points, but there is no current going into it. And if we connect this to the ground, we normally call, we sometimes call uh, this part up here a virtual ground. So there's no current going in, but it's anyway kept at ground potential. And if we now attach our photodiode to this point here, then this point won't change in, uh, this point won't change, it will be steady at at grounded potential, so there will be no voltage change over a, uh, over a photodiode. But what will happen in, but the current coming out of here, since it can't go into the operational ampler fire, it will go through this resistance up here. So this is at ground potential, the current goes through this resistance, and then the output voltage changes, just like the voltage in this point changed, changed before. But since there is no change of the voltage in this point, this circuit can be very fast. So now we have built uh, a fast circuit which can co convert the current out from the photodiode into a voltage. So when you very often when we are measuring a light level we are we are fighting noise. So let's stop up and say how precisely can we measure light and we will divide this into a couple of sections where we firstly will discuss the physical background to some of the noise sources particularly the so-called shot noise and then we will look at how does this physical background convert into some number which is useful and I will quickly do show you how, uh, how this connects together so that you have seen it uh, and, and then we will go on to discuss a few different other no noise sources. So let's start. So I mean we would like to measure some signal and this can be a function of time or, uh, uh, we can have something like which is time varying like this. But what we actually get out of our measurement apparatus is something like this, and then the signal we actually would like to measure drowns uh, in the background noise of our measurement. So where does this noise come from? We're going to look at a few different noise sources, and can we improve it? So we have previously looked at this setup. But now, for simplicity, let's just look at one signal channel. So we'll just ignore the other channels and have a signal, a single detector. And of course, you can just look at the, you can, you can get this look at the same noise properties in many detectors. But for simplicity, let's do this. And what I'm discussing now is applicable for typical light sources like black body radiators and. So normally you have many modes of a black body radiator or lasers, coherent light sources. There are some special light sources where what I say now don't apply. For example, there are some light sources like squeezed light, where you can have very, very small amplitude fluctuations, but at the same time you have no, you have no idea what the face is. Uh, but this, uh, this is for general normal light sources. So light is emitted or at least uh, measured in quantities uh, in quantized package called photons and there is a statistic there's a these are statistically distributed so when you measure the photons are random uh, so they are emitted or absorbed at random times and in this case we will we will denote the number of average number of emitted photons ns uh, when we discuss this. So there's a few things you have to remember like this NS. And the standard deviation of a number of photons, so that means uh, if we measure many, if we do the same measurement over and over again, what will the standard deviation be? So the average number of photons will be NS and the standard deviation of our measurements will be uh, N NS. Uh, and this, now with this uh, this standard deviation comes from the fact that our light is, is uh, Poisson distributed. 
And this noise, so it come, it comes from the physical background that uh, our our no our photons are particles, and we will have to we will can only measure them in package. And this kind of noise is generally called uh, shot noise, and it's as I said, Poisson distribution. It's Poisson distributed. So the uncertainty of how many uh, the standard deviation of how many photons you will detect in a certain measurements, that's n n s is given by the square root of the average number of photons you will detect or particle. This goes for many other particles as well. So the uncertainty, the more particles you have, the bigger the uncertainty is. But the but for, for the relative, we'll come back to the, the relative uncertainty becomes smaller if you have more photons. So if you see here, here you have few photons and it's not so wide. You have more photons and it become wider, even more photons become even wider, even more photons become even wider. But the relative spread becomes smaller. And we normally denote the relative spread as, uh, see here, as signal to noise ratio, SNR. So that's exactly what it means. How large is the signal to how large is the noise? And this is given by the average number of photons by the standard deviation of a number of photons. So if you have a signal to noise of, of a thousand, then on average your, your noise is a thousand times smaller than your signal. And of course, we can just stick in the numbers from this formula up here in this, and it's ns divided by the square root of ns, and that's just the square root of the number of photons. So if we have, for example, if we have 10,000 uh, 10, photons, we will have a standard deviation each time we measure of 100 photons. So we can measure with an accuracy of about 1,000. So uh, on, if we turn it around the other way, if we want to do a measurement with a certain accuracy, we have to accumulate enough photons. So for example, let's say we want to have an accuracy of, of, uh, a, thousand, of a thousand, then we will need to accumulate one million photons at least if we have no other noise sources on average to get the accuracy we want. So that also means, and we'll come back to that a little bit later, but that also means that if you have a certain intensity, if you need to do a measurement with a very high accuracy, you have to accumulate for a long time. The flip side of that is that that means that you bunch your measurement together into bigger and bigger chunks, and that means that your frequency of measurement is smaller and smaller. So if you're only measuring in a small frequency interval, you, you can have higher accuracy. Okay, so the physical background, this is what I want you to remember, the physical background to this is that there's a, there's a distribution of how the photons come in and the SNR is given by the, the, the noise is given by the square root of a number of photons. So this is the important physical background. Now, in practice, this is a little bit cumbersome because you have to go through this calculation to get there. So in practice, you want to convert this into a noise current. So you have a certain, you have a certain number of photons coming in, giving you a certain, uh, a certain current coming out of your photodiode, so your signal current. And you now want to convert this in with this signal current, how large noise current do I have? So I'm quickly going to go through uh, how to do that to show you that it actually connected uh, to this statistic, to the statistics I talked about in the last slide. But the, the details of this is, is not so, is not so uh, important. Rather, the end result is. So here is the calculation. So the way this is done is basically you write the uh, current as a, the number of charges on, over a certain time, a charge over a certain time. That's the definition of current. And then you write then you want to convert the charge to number of particles, and then you take the, the charge of one electron times the number of electrons you have uh, and during this time. And then you can, of course, then write the number of uh, electrons you have in this case. So in this case, oh yeah, I should say that. You have a certain number of photons coming in, and then they have some probability of being converted to electrons. That means the lowest point in your detection system, the lowest number you have anywhere, is the number of electrons. And the statistics works just as well for these electrons. So therefore I'm doing it for electrons and not for, uh, not for photons. Okay, uh, so, and then the, if the noise is the square root of the 
the, the, the number of noise particles is uh, the square root of a number of particles. So that's the square root of this thing we have over here. And then the same argument as we did here, we can do for the noise current. We can just say that, okay, if we have a certain noise current, we can write, write that as a noise charge uh, for during a certain time. And that way we can uh, number of noise uh, electrons times the charge of an electron during that time. And we can keep on and we, uh, and then we can just take ns from up here. I mean, we have ns here and we can take the ns in here. And we stick that in and we see we have q here and q here and delta t here and delta t here so we can rewrite it and we get to this thing. So now we have an expression for our noise current. So this is our, how large our noise current in, is compared to our signal current. And this is of course in time uh, because we have delta t here. And then we can Fourier transform this and we get it into, we get it into the frequency domain instead. And when we do this, we actually have both positive and negative frequencies. So we get a little bit, we get a two uh, uh, appearing here. So this is the expression for the noise current given that you have a certain signal current. And then you see over here is the bandwidth. So now we're connecting to what I said before. If you measure during a long time, uh, then you will collect a lot of, then you will collect a lot of uh, statistics a lot of photons and then your noise will be smaller. So, so, and a, and a long time, that corresponds to small frequency bandwidth. So, and it scales with a square root of a frequency bandwidth. So the specification, okay, we rewrite this, uh, so we have it per frequency, and then we have a noise, uh, the noise current per square root of frequency is equal to, if you just stick in the numbers for this, 0 0.57 times the square root of the current and this is given in nano amp per square root of hertz. So it's this is directly in, in one, if you're having one hertz, you will re directly get this bandwidth. But if you have to take, if you want the noise current in a higher bandwidth, that means during shorter measurement time, you have to take it times the square root of a bandwidth you're measuring in. So this is really useful to, to calculate how well can I do my measurement? What, how large will my noise current be from the shot, from shot noise? So that was the most fundamental noise source, but there are also some other noise source. So the, if you have no light impinging on the photodiode, you also have a dark current going through it. That means there's a little bit of a current going through it, uh, even if when there's no light. And this will also, you will also have a shot noise on this dark current. So the next noise source is resistor noise, which comes from this resistor. I will talk a little bit more about that and transimpedance amplifier current noise and voltage noise. Now I have some slide about this. I will go through these very quickly because I think it's good that you have it. I just wanted to put it together somewhere so, so that you have it together. So okay, let me just get this on here. So the johnson nyquist noise, it comes because the, in the carriers, due to thermal mo mo motion of the carriers, uh, the charge carriers inside, inside the resistor, that means that you will have a small voltage uh, noise over uh, a resistor. And the larger the resistor is, the larger this voltage noise is. So there's nothing special for, for, uh, this, uh, in this, for this application. This is a general feature of resistors. And the size of this voltage noise is given by uh, this expression here, where T is the temp, this is Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature, and and R is the resistance. And then this is also given uh, in a certain frequency band. So the larger the resistance is, the larger the voltage noise is. But what we are doing here, we are, we are of course measuring the voltage output here and the noise goes like the square root of a, of a resistor, but the output voltage goes linearly with the resistor. So, be, having a bigger resistor means a, le, a smaller relative noise source, but it also means a smaller relative noise, but it also means a slower amplifier. So there's a trade-off between how fast your transimpedance amplifier is and how low, low, low your noise is. So since we have a resistance and uh, we have a voltage noise, we can just use Ohm's law to turn this into a noise current instead. And then we get this uh, formula over here, where you see that it, it scales with a larger R, we get a smaller noise current. And then we can rewrite it like 
uh, like one of these laws which I have in one last one, which is easier to can, to remember, which is 0 0.13 divided by the square root of R, and then you get the noise, the Johnson noise in nanoamp per square root of Hertz. Okay. The next one was the dark current of a photon uh, of a of a photodiode, and I have written down uh, the size of this noise source as well. And it's of course given by the same, since it's shot noise, it's given by the same shot noise formula that we had before, but now it's the dark current uh, which we are having here. And this one is all often stated in as, as a power falling in, and then it's called NEP in the data sheet. You can recalculate from noise equivalent power to uh, dark current uh, to dark current of your photodiode by use by this. And then you have uh, input current noise which is specified for, so it's a current noise going into the op, op amp, it's specified for the trans impedance amplifier, and you have a voltage noise, which is also specified for a trans impedance amplifier. And here I have talked a little bit about how to convert, how you do the conversion from this uh, noise source to the noise current here, but I won't go into details of this. And then finally, you can just put everything together and you have a total noise budget for a, for a trans impedance amplifier. So, the, okay, so to put it all together, I think the important messages from this is the, the, there are several different noise sources. It's if you choose a bigger resistor in your trans impedance amplifier, the relative noise on the output signal becomes smaller. And uh, if you measure for longer and you collect more photons, your, your shot noise becomes smaller. Or if you have more light and you have therefore have more phot photons per unit times, your shot noise becomes smaller. And I, it's, also, it's also important to know that the, the standard deviation of your, the number of photons you will collect is given by the square root of the number of photons you have, or the same for the electrons we have, which we converted it to. So now I will leave noise and I will quickly talk about a few other different important parameters for photodiodes. Uh, so as I said before, photodiodes can have different efficiency in converting, uh, in converting incoming photons to, uh, uh, to current. And there is one number which is called quantum, ef uh, quantum efficiency and that's just saying how many percent of the incoming photons are converted to electrons. But a more often used uh, number is the responsivity. And if we have a signal power which comes in, which is P, uh, and then we have a, uh, a current coming out, which e, a, a signal current IS, then the responsivity uh, is given by the signal current divided by the power. And this is often given in the data sheets for your photodiode. So for example, let's see if I can get an example here. Here we have a typical, uh, a typical curve like that. So the responsivity is dependent on the wavelength. So down here we have a wavelength and here we have responsivity in how many amp of current you get per watt of light coming in. And let me just quickly draw in the 100% quantum efficiency line. So you see here, here you have 100% uh, qu quantum efficiency. And the reason why this goes up is because as you go to higher wavelength, that means that each photon contains less energy, so you have more photons. And you can also see that the detector sort of follows this line, but there is some, it's, it's a little bit below it. So in this case, the optimal, if you have 100% here, for example, you roughly will get, you get, you get 0.5 amp per watt, and here we are instead getting uh, 0.4 amp per watt. This means that our quantum efficiency uh, in this case would be 80%. And it looks like it's about the same along this curve. And here we also have noise equivalent power of a whole detector. What I discussed before was noise equivalent power of just a photodiode. But you can write down the same noise equivalent power for a photodiode. And this is the, a measure uh, of, of how noisy your detector is overall, including everything. And it tells you a little bit about how large power you need to have to be able to measure the field. The definition is that it's, it's the signal power which gives you a signal noise to one in a bandwidth of one hertz. So this is also given by, you see, hertz to the power of uh, a half. This is given per power per square root of hertz. So you can read, you can, by, by taking this times, 
your measurement band so times the square root of your measurement bandwidth. So if for, for example, if you're measuring a bandwidth of let, let's say 10,000 Hertz, you take the square root of 10,000 Hertz, that's a thousand. And then you take it times this number. So this is 29.2 picowatts, then you get 29.2 nanowatts. And that's for that power, you will have an SNR of one. So that's basically your noise level uh, in your measurement. And just a quick caveat here, since they typically give your NEP at a certain wavelength, and since you have your noise is constant of your detector, but you have different amounts of photons depending on your wavelengths. But so, so they typically give your noise equivalent power at the peak here, but you can easily recalculate what noise equivalent power you will have at some other wavelength using this formula. And I'm not going to say and if it's just given by the responsivity where we normally ma measure it, which is the max point here, but divided by the responsivity at the wavelength you're into, 10 times this minimum net, which is what they generally give in the data sheet. I, again, I include this so that you have it in your slides if you, if you need to use this in the future. So there is also two different distinct uh, types of photodiodes. Uh, which are widely used. There's the P and diode, where it's a simply uh, P and N doped uh, semiconductors. And the good thing about P and diodes is uh, that they have very low dark current. Unfortunately, the layers inside it, the P and N layer, is very close together, which means that they have a high capacitance, so they are terribly slow. But for low light applications, they can be really useful. Uh, and quickly, Again, like we discussed, I, I quickly said it before, but the way these photodiodes work is that when light comes in, they go, go into this region in between and they create an electron hole pair and they come out. So it's basically reverse of the LEDs, which we talked about earlier. Now, there's another kind of diode, which is called a, a pin diode. And they have several advantages over a P and diode. So in, in between them, they have an undoped intrinsic region in between the P and the N-doped region. And that means that the P and the N-doped region comes further apart. And that also means that they have much lower capacitance, which means that they can be much faster up to tens of, gig, uh, of gigahertz. And since this, is, since this region where they uh, absorb the light is much thicker, they also have much higher quantum efficiency than, than, P, uh, than P and diodes. The, uh, the downside with these is that they have a higher dark current than uh, the P and diodes. So here we have a picture of it, how the light is coming in and being absorbed in the intrinsic region, and then the electrons and holes, they are migrate out to the, uh, to the P and the N region. And in the applications I have come across uh, during my years, the pin diodes are much, uh, much more commonly used. And it, I'm telling you these things because if you ever need to buy a diode, the first thing you do have to do when you come to a diode company who sells diodes is choose if you want a pin or a PN diode. I mean, it's good to know what their pros and cons are. So photodiodes comes in very many different, uh, different flavors. So they are made out of different materials with different band gap, which can absorb different, uh, different light, uh, colors of light. And up here again is the, this is a curve of responsivity and here is the 100% quantum efficiency. And these ones here, which are smack on 100%, they're actually not a photodiode uh, by itself. It's a setup where the reflection of a photodiode is redirected uh, to the photodiode again. And these are used for calibration purposes. And uh, I think they are NIST, for example, use these. But we see here for low wavelength, for example, gallium phosphide, and then we have here we have some, uh, for, for visible range, we have uh, silicon photodiodes. And then as we get into telecom wavelengths above about a micrometer and up to over about 1.6 or so, we have indium gallium arsenide uh, photodiodes. And if we want to go, go to even longer wavelengths, there are other materials. So here is, a, here is a picture of different materials and the wavelength and you see there are photodiodes all the way up to uh, there are photodiodes all the way up to 40 micrometers. So something to note here is that as you start going to higher, uh, as you're going to longer wavelengths, it starts to say that there is 77 Kelvin 
and then as you get even longer they, they start becoming uh, cooled by liquid uh, helium so this is liquid nitrogen of course that is because the the energy as you go to longer wavelength the the temp the, the the temperature of the detector if it's not cooled is high enough to excite a, a electron hole pair by itself so therefore you will have a very high dark current if you run them at lower uh, at lower temperature okay so that's what that was a long story about photodiodes but photodiodes are actually very important and used in many uh, many different spectroscopic applications and and uh, it's very important to be know how they work to be able to design systems with very low noise and now we will move on to a uh, older detector which which is still used and it's a so-called photomultiplier tube and they have some virtues like they can have a very big collection area and still be very fast uh, or relatively fast where they can have a rise time as low as about 100 picoseconds okay so they work in the following way you have an, a photon coming in and it hits a material where through the photoelectric effect again an electron is generated and down here we have applied a large voltage which is positive over here and we have put together a string of resistors and that means there's a small current going through all of these resistors and that means that you get an equal voltage ladder from uh, from the gate over here which is the most negative part all the way over here which is the most positive part so for between each of these there's the same voltage and this electron will now get accelerated in this because this is more positive than this it will get accelerated and it will smash into this dynode with a high speed and when it does that it knocks out a whole bunch of electrons when it hits this dino down here and then each of these electrons hits out a bunch so you get this multiplying effect as you go through it and at the output you can have a multiplying effect of 100,000 or even more and that means that from one single electron you get maybe, maybe so many thousand electrons coming out and a much larger current so it, it has an inherent uh, amplifications which allows you to measure uh, single photons now the downside of these detector is that they have generally have a fairly poor quantum efficiency so down here in the low blue range they can have a quantum efficiency of about 30 percent and that sets the shot noise remember but if you go up to the visible range the quantum efficiency is generally much worse. I mean, here if we, for example, look at, at 600 nanometer, which is uh, a sort of orangey color going towards red, then we have a quantum efficiency of something like 12% or so. There is also a related detector uh, which allows you to get, uh, which allows you to get uh, spatial resolution as well. And it's also used in image amplification uh, in Im uh, um, image amplification application. So what you have here is a so-called microchannel plate. So you have a plate uh, with a whole bunch of, of uh, holes drilled in it, small holes, and you have put a high voltage across this plate. When an uh, incoming electron, and I will tell you, I will put uh, on the rest of elements in a little while, when an incoming electron hits one of, inside this hole, it bounces forward and back and you have the same multiplication effects. It ex gets accelerated, knocks off more electrons, and you get a shower of exiting, uh, exiting electrons. And these can be used just to amplify electrons, and in some applications that's what you do. But if you want to use them for a detector, uh, or sorry, sorry for image amplification, then you will add a photocathode, just like you had in... Uh, uh, in the photomultiplier tube where an elect uh, photon comes in, hits the photocathode, uh, photoelectric effect knocks out a photon and the photon is accelerated down into this one of these holes in the channel plate. And then on the other side, you can of course put this to a detector which measures the electrons, but in, if you do image amplification, you then let all of these electrons hit a phosphor screen. So then this screen will light up, but it will light up but uh, it, the light coming off it will be much stronger than the light coming in hitting the photo cathode tube. And these 
are the ones used in in these uh, image amplification scenarios like these mirror these binoculars uh, people wear uh, to to see at night night vision goggles or i should say this is one of the techniques because there's also they, there are also ir cameras used uh, for these kind of applications there is also a photodiode which is related to the photomultiplier it's like a mix of a photomultiplier tube uh, and and a photodiode and it's called avalanche photodiode or apd and in this uh, photodiode you have a very high voltage across an intrinsic region uh, and what happens is here you have some light coming in you create an electron hole pair just like you just like you did in the normal photodiodes but the voltage is so high that you accelerate the electron and this electron can then inside the material knock off a shower of electrons so and then again they get accelerated more electrons and accelerating more electrons these do not generally not have as high amplification as a photomultiplier tube but they uh, but they are much smaller and much easier and they can also have the added benefit of having much higher quantum efficiency so here is a detector from some manufacturer which is using such an APD and it can have an ef a quantum efficiency of 70%. So that means 70% of the photons get converted into electrons or actually gets converted to a signal, a large signal you can measure. Uh, it can work within the wavelength range, the visible wavelength range. It can have a very low dark count rate. That's a, the dark count rate of these detectors. How many times do you say there was a photon when there wasn't a photon? and they can be as low as 10 photons per second. And the timing resolution, there are detectors with better timing resolution than this, but it can have a timing resolution of a nanosecond. So we detect when the photon arrived, but it takes some time to reset these detectors before they can detect the new photons. So they can only, they can only detect uh, a, photon, a new photon after 30 nanoseconds. That's, these numbers, of course, differ from different detectors, so I'm just using one detector as an, an example. There's another kind of new detector, which it's not so old, uh, which is a superconducting nanowire single photon detector, which has really interesting properties. So what you see here is a superconducting wire and it goes forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, forward and back like this. And the way it is that it's cooled down uh, so low that this wire becomes superconducting. And then you run a current through it and the current you run through it is, cr is close to the point the critical point where it stops being superconducting and if a single photon comes in and hits this it stops being superconducting and then that means that the resistance of this wire goes up dramatically and well I mean it goes it's from the beginning there is no resistance so of course it goes up dramatically but it becomes high enough that you can easily detect it and these detectors have some uh, rather spectacular performance they can have an efficiency above 90%, so that's a quantum efficiency. They work in a very important telecom wavelength range where the photons are small, so it's yet not always so easy to make detectors. It has, has a very low timing jitter of uh, above 100, about 150 picosecond, but again, it has a little bit of a reset time, so 40 nanosecond. But this reset time is going down. The downside is that they have to be kept at uh, one Kelvin, so you need a cryostat to cool these detectors.